Hello, my name is Naan Alobwede. I be the author of Scars to Stars, my new book we I just recently published. This book they tell you my story of abuse, mentally, physically, and emotionally, and my choice for stay in a relationship where it be very, very bad, toxic, and unhealthy for me. I did share my story today with the hope say it will inspire, encourage. And even strengthen any person really go through the things and way I get to go through. So make we talk, make we discuss, and make we get a conversation on this matter. Salut, je suis Anne Alobwede, auteur de Cicatrices aux étoiles, ma mémoire récemment publiée qui raconte mon histoire de violence mentale, physique et émotionnelle, et mon choix de rester dans une relation malsain jusqu'à ça devient une choix de la vie ou de la mort. Je partage mon histoire avec l'espoir que ça va inspirer, encourager ou fortifier quelqu'un. Donc, parlons et ayons une conversation. So, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Conversations from the Diaspora, a Building Africa's Future podcast. And as usual, I'm your host, your sister, and your friend, in Kiru. And today, I am joined by a lovely woman, and I'm going to give her a brief moment just to introduce herself to you all. Hi, everyone. I'm Anne Alobwede. Um, I recently published a book called Scars to Stars. It's actually a memoir, uh, a, a story of true life events on my life for the past. 13 years or so um, and this book kind of takes the reader through my journey of emotional physical and mental abuse and um, the different ways in which I I work toward coping um, through that pain and um, depression and just finding ways to bounce back from all the adversities that I had been through um, and I'm excited to be here today and to um, talk a little bit more about myself and what I went through and um, a little bit more about my book and the lessons that um, I intend to teach people who will read the book and the lessons that I learned um, throughout the years and while writing the book too. So I'm excited to be here today. Thank you so much, um, sis. I really appreciate that. And uh, just for the viewers who haven't seen it yet, here's the book. Very beautiful, very lovely book. And to be honest, it's one of the first books that I've like actually read, like sat down for a long, like it's been a while that I just sat and read it like in one sitting. So it's, it's, it's really captivating, it's really interesting. And so it's one of the reasons why I wanted to interview you because as you know, we've known each other for a long time now. You know, I've, I think I knew you through Auntie Fran and through my friend Gloria. So, and you know, Ruth and all these other people that, you know, you know, your fan members and some of my friends and stuff like that. So like when I heard, you know, everything that happened, you know, as you can imagine, it was very hard to believe. Like I didn't understand, I didn't expect it. So like, you know, hearing that you were out and you know, that you wrote this story, I was like, wow, this is actually an amazing, you know, I, I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to hear from you directly because of course you might hear stories, you might hear, you know, everyone else's interpretation of what happened, but when you actually hear from the actual person who experienced it, you know, it's, it's, it's better to hear from the person directly is pretty much what I'm trying to say. So you, you already um, briefly told us, you know, a little bit about yourself and uh, what your story is about. But um, there was one thing that you kind of uh, mentioned at different points in your, in your story as I read it. And I would like for you to kind of just elaborate for us a little bit as to why you felt the need, you know, to write this story and for the world to know about what happened and everything else. But the question that you repeated in your story was, how did I get here? And that's the same question I'd like to ask you. Could you tell us a little bit more about your journey from um, life in Cameroon, how you viewed the U.S. before coming here, and some of your experiences with school um, after coming here? How was that like? Um, well, life in Cameroon was beautiful because I was a, I was a kid, I was a child. I didn't have to worry about a lot of things. Um, and I moved to the United States at the age of 17 um, to go to college. and. Um, in the beginning, um, it was okay. And then a lot of challenges, you know, started coming my way, trying to 
work and go to school as an international student and just having to deal with living in a new environment um, and a lot of things were were kind of new but I was fortunate to have family um, my brother my cousins my aunts and uncles that had been here for a while so they were able to help me navigate through you know this new environment and in a foreign land but um, down the road if you as you've read in the book and for those who will get a chance to read my book um, I got caught up in a relationship that turned out to be an abusive one and um, I lived through an abusive relationship for six years and it was it was a mix of mental physical emotional abuse and which eventually led me to depression and um, I was depressed for a while I, I tried to deny it I lived in denial for a very long time but um, it was real and depression is real and then I ended up in a North Carolina women's facility because I had been keeping in a lot of hurt in me for years and years and years and years um, from my abuse and being in a relationship that was based on lies from the first day and um, people will usually say that you know I snapped and um, the consequence was I ended up in prison where I did 58 months in time and then, and then I went into immigration custody where I did 10 months trying to um, fight my stay in the US. So the lessons I'm trying to teach people, there's so many lessons in my book. Um, first, of, The first one is abuse is, abuse is real and it's not just physical abuse that is real emotional abuse is as serious as mental abuse and as physical abuse so i urge people anybody that if you're in an abusive relationship and you sometimes we don't notice the signs and then other times we do but we choose to stay there like in my situation um it's not worth it Nobody deserves to be abused by a spouse, a, a, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, even a friend, you know, or a parent or a sibling. Nobody deserves that. But um, if you're in a, like that. Sis, I'm sorry, because um, I know you're pretty much covering a lot of things that we're going to discuss. Uh, I just wanted to I take a few moments to kind of break it down a little bit for the um, for the viewers and for the listeners. Um, okay. Just to paint a picture for them, for those who haven't read the book yet. So you okay. met this guy at, you know, 19, you were 19 and he was about to be 31. So that's like about 11 to 12 year age difference. Um, yes. And earlier on in the relationship, he started doing things you weren't comfortable with, like traveling out of the country without you. And then later began gaslighting you and accusing you of things that he himself was doing, stalking you, controlling you in other ways. Um, you know, as you mentioned, physical, mental, and emotional abuse. And to top everything off, he eventually married another woman while you two were still married despite the fact that this was the same woman that he claimed he had nothing to do with. So, you know, last month, you know, October was um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And there's one thing that I've um, just kind of reflected on. I think we as women, um, just as you express in your book, we oftentimes make excuses for maybe men in our lives without, um, uh, despite knowing that we aren't happy and then we end up suppressing those feelings. And, um, you know, in, in order, uh, sorry, suppressing our feelings and suppressing our own happiness just to ensure peace for them, not so much for ourselves. So with that in mind, um, looking back, would you say there were any warning signs in the beginning, um, like when you first met him and everything, like that you kind of knew, or maybe you saw this person probably wasn't the best for you, you probably saw that he was, you know, abusive. And as it relates to the age difference, the only reason why I bring that up is because you were still kind of gradually becoming an adult. You just barely became an adult at that age, and he was already in his early 30s. Do you think that if you had met him, maybe in your mid to late 20s, would your perspective probably have been different, or your tolerance towards, you know, some of his behavior? think would have been different How, what can you say to that um i'm gonna talk about if i met him when i was a little bit much older i don't i can't say for sure if my relationship would have been different or if i would have left the relationship because i was being abused because um there's women there are women in their 30s that are being are that are in abusive relationships and they either notice the signs and choose to stay in it and and others don't see the signs 
so i don't think that it has to do with um the age you know because there are women who have been you know have been in an abusive relationship for years been married to an abusive person for years and they're still there and still haven't had the courage or accepted the fact that hey look this is not normal you know i'm not this is not this is not normal this is not what i need to go through or deal with this is not what love is called you know so i can't really say for sure that if i was much older when i met him i wouldn't have made the same mistakes that i made because i don't think it has anything to do with age i think it has everything to do with choices because i did realize um earlier on in my relationship with him that he was abusive although he wasn't abusive in the beginning physically he had showed me signs and the first sign that he showed me was the controlling attitude and the possessive attitude and i think to me that is the first warning sign of an abusive partner you know or anybody who is abusive they are possessive and they want to be in control of your time they want to isolate you they don't want you to spend time with anybody and it usually starts off like that and then gradually goes to physical and they start putting their hands on you and you know the cycle continues so i did the signs in the beginning when he was possessive and controlling and and and, and wanting to know where i was where i was going all the time what i was doing um trying to spend you know all my free time with him and to the point of not even wanting me to spend time with my family so yeah i did notice the signs earlier but i made the choice <laughs> to stay hmm. so one of the things that you shared with me you know prior to this conversation um was how you felt very alone in the sense that you know again due to some of our cultural stigmas or you know the way that we were brought up there's this tendency that we have in our communities to not speak out about personal issues and as a result of this your personal um you know your mental your mental health decline I know how you got to that point, you know, after reading your book, but why didn't you, um, or why do you think that you didn't seek out the necessarily, um, necessary help or support from friends or family? And what steps have you made since then to try to get back on track as it relates to your mental health and your overall well-being? I know in the book you mentioned something about, um, I think when you, you, uh, you spoke with a therapist or someone, but you didn't really like that session because I guess it was maybe too traumatic at that point. But how about now? Have you been seeking counseling or how did you or what have you done pretty much take care of yourself since then? Um, well, when I first when I started getting depressed, um, I was in denial. <laughs> I couldn't believe that I was I, the signs were there. Um, I had lost interest in a lot of things that I used to love to do. And that's like the first like the warning sign of depression. Um, and um, I couldn't sleep at night. I was restless. You know, most of the time I wanted to isolate myself. I didn't want to be around people. So when I started feeling that way, I wanted to talk to somebody. I wanted to tell somebody what I was going through, but I was afraid that I was going to be, I was going to be judged, especially for the reasons why I was getting depressed. So I didn't feel comfortable talking to anybody about it. But if I want to talk about the way that I dealt with my depression, um, I didn't per se talk to anybody. I didn't talk to a therapist. I did talk to a therapist one time when I was in jail and it was a really tough experience for me because I had to basically, you know, relieve the past and talk about everything that had happened. But um, one thing that has helped me a lot is to when I'm going through certain stuff and I feel like I'm falling back into depression or I'm falling into a depression, I try to talk to people. I try to be around people because that helps a lot. You know, I, I, I try to look for that one person. There's always that one person that's going to be willing to listen to you or, or willing to give you their time and not be judgmental. So talking about my story, you know, writing my story was very, very therapeutic, very, very therapeutic. Um, to me, I feel like this book is my therapy <laughs> because every now and then I go back and I read it and it helps me through my bad days and the days when I, I feel like I'm having a, a time where I'm, I'm living in regret. Um, I go back and read my book and, it, and it, it's therapy for me. 
So putting my story out there, talking about it, it's not easy, but it's it's some form of therapy for me. Hmm. I'm actually glad that you said that because I was going to ask you, um, you know, writing your story and then, you know, you know, going back and rereading some maybe chapters when you were editing, whatever. How, like, did those feelings come back strongly? Like, how, like, is it difficult for you sometimes to read your story or to kind of talk about, like, even this moment that you and I are having, like, are you having any negative feelings or, like, how are you, like, like, where you are now, how do you feel sharing your story, talking about it openly and, you know, on this kind of platform? Um, it took me 60, it took me, um, maybe about four years to write this book. <laughs> Um, I would write and then when I got to a part where, you know, talked a lot about the pain that I had been through, I'll have to stop because sometimes I'll, I, I can't even, you know, write. I have to push through my tears to write the book. So it wasn't an easy journey, but I kept telling myself that you have to do this because somebody out there needs this. Somebody out, out there needs to hear your story. Somebody out there is either going through what you're what you went through and they're heading toward the same direction that you were taking or somebody has already you know hit rock bottom and they need to hear your story to 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 show them that there's hope you know you have to keep your hope alive you have to keep pushing through as long as you have life and i wrote this story because i wish somebody i wish i was bold enough to talk about what i was going through maybe somebody would have you know helped talk me through whatever it is I was going through and I wouldn't have ended up in the jail, you know, but it wasn't easy. It's never easy. Even when I read my book, I've read it so, so many times. <laughs> there are times when I have to stop, you know, but it's also helpful to see how far I've come and to see that I was able to overcome the abuse, um, the, the mental health problems and incarceration and just come out on the winning side if i can say that so it's it's not an easy journey and it wasn't easy writing the book but i had to do it for somebody out there who needs to to um learn a lesson or two from my experiences mm. that is true so i mean what you just said kind of resonated a lot with me because i know i know you have an older brother but at the same time you're like the big sister to like so many people so when you're going through something like that is like who do you you know, lean on because you're supposed to be, I guess, the big sister that everyone looks up to, especially in our cultures, where it's kind of like hard to really open up in general. But especially if you are like, you know, the big sister in the home or for your younger cousins or whoever the case may be. So like, do you think that's part of the reason why it was hard for you to like seek the help that you needed when you were going through, you know, your challenges? Yeah, that was that's that's one of the reasons why I didn't seek help. And one of the reason, the main reason I didn't talk to anybody about it was because Nobody in my family really cared for the man that I was dating and eventually married. They didn't like it, you yes. know, read my book and um, they didn't really care for him. They didn't think he was good for me and they tolerated him because because that's what I wanted. You know, mm -hmm. and families like that, they will tolerate, you know, your friends or the people that you bring to them because they love you. And if, it's some if something is important to you, it's important to them, you know, and um, I couldn't bring myself to tell them what he was putting me through because this is the man that they had warned me for years and years. Um, and my friends constantly told me he wasn't good for me. And it's funny that they could see that even when I had not told them exactly what was, you know, the truth of my, you know, the details of the crazy relationship I was in. Mm. Yeah. So it's just one of the things that you talked about um you know, in your book, you read about depression, obviously, you know, in nursing school and how you truly, you know, personally, you didn't really understand it until it became your own reality. So again, as this is often the case in our communities, um, as Africans and as black people in general, we view depression and issues with mental health as something from the devil or something associated with, you know, white people, for example, forgetting the fact that it's a very human feeling that can be brought on us, you know, at different stages in our lives. So, and we've been we've also been socially conditioned um you know not to share our emotions our weaknesses or ask for help um so one good thing i would say you know now with everything that's been going on 
I feel like more people are kind of normalizing mental health awareness and, um, you know, asking for help whenever necessary and um, paying attention to your self-care and stuff like that. So with your own experiences, uh, what do you tell others who maybe still believe or feel that depression is something, depression or anxiety are, are just things that can be wished away? Like, for example, if you're talking to maybe an older African uh, relative, for example. <laughs> Um, you know what? I'll tell them depression is real. It's not a joke. And they always say that you never know how real something is until it hits home. And it hit home with me. Because what I went through being depressed, I will not wish it on anybody. And it has definitely changed my perception of um, the whole disease, the whole mental health disease called depression. And um, if somebody comes to me and tells me, and tells me, hey, look, I don't feel good. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to somebody. I feel like I'm, I'm getting depressed. I will stop everything that I'm doing just to listen to that person. Because most of the times, people just want you to listen to them when they're going through something. When you push them away, it makes them feel worthless. And it makes them feel like, okay, I don't know what to do with myself. And I say this because when I was incarcerated, I witnessed, I don't talk, I didn't talk about this in my book, but I did witness a lot of women try to kill themselves because they were depressed. Because they, they felt like they didn't have nobody to talk to, you know, and when they try to talk to people, other inmates, they want to listen to them and they didn't even have family that would listen to them because their family was so judgmental of them being in the position where they were so i just want to put it out there that depression is real and depression can kill it can take away a life so and i do urge everybody everybody out there anybody who feels like they're depressed they feel like they're overwhelmed with life and whatever is going on with them. Talk to somebody. Trust me, there's somebody out there that is going to listen to you. That's very powerful. I mean, I know most of this obviously is in your in your book, so people can like read it. But what can you, I guess, what are you comfortable, I guess, telling the, those who are listening as far as some of the things that happened, you know, that led to um, you being uh, locked up and everything? Um, the short of it, I had been holding on to a lot of hurt and a lot of pain for years. And, um, it's funny because I was in, I was in a position where I was trying to get out of the relationship. And in the split of the moment, I found out that the man that I was married to is married to some other person. And that threw me off. <laughs> that threw me up and I, 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 within seconds, I lost every sense that I ever, God ever gave me. And, you know, I say it in my book that even my demons, even my demons could not understand what was going. So, and that's how I, I you know, eventually landed up in a, um, in a correctional facility. And this is to say that don't, we don't need to wait for anybody to get you to that point where you have no control of, over yourself because it can happen. When I wrote my book, the first pages of my book begins with never say never. You never know what will happen. So don't let anybody get you to that point where you feel like, okay, I don't have any, I don't have control of myself anymore because it can happen and it can happen to anybody. I never knew what's going to happen to me, but it did. So, um, yeah, I, I held on to a lot, a lot of pain for years, all by myself. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know, like when you, I guess, because I, I, I totally agree with you. I feel like um, whenever you get to that point where, you know, your life is almost pretty much totally dependent on someone else. Like your happiness and everything else is just you've gotten to like a very dangerous point where you know you can no longer fully function in your own you know happiness your own right because 
everything you do is, you know, kind of based on this other person. And I know some of the things that you expressed, you know, in your story, um, he kind of put a lot of things over your head, like, um, you know, holding off processing paperwork because, you know, oh, well, if you if you call the police, then I'm going to, you know, you're going to get deported. Like lots of kind of threats like that kind of that put you in a position where you almost felt like like there was no hope. There was nothing that you could really do because you know, like even for your like birthdays, spending time with your family, as you mentioned, it's like, well, you spend time with them or you spend time with me. Just all these kind of putting you in ter terrible situations where you're forced to choose this other person over your own self and over your family and other loved ones. Um, you know, that's definitely a very bad uh, feeling and very bad position to be in. And there was like a very like strong quote that you um, that I wrote down here. I think it was on page 58 where you said something like, um, I was busy trailing behind my boyfriend um, before you guys were married, obviously, giving him the full permission okay. of being the superintendent of my life. So can you just kind of like talk to the, you know, the viewers and the listeners a little bit more about what you meant by, you know, allowing this person to be the, like a superintendent of your life? Um, again, I'm going to say this to anybody who's watching this and anybody who's listening to this never allow anybody to take possession and, and 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 control of your life you have control over your life and um when i say that i allow him to be the superintendent of my life it, i was basically trying to paint the picture of him wanting to be in control you know um in prison the head the head of the prison is called the superintendent or the warden so he's over all the prisoners you know and he, he makes the decisions he dictates you know this is what you have you guys have to do this is how you have to do it if you don't do it you get sanctioned you get punished you know it's like being a principal in a school so that's what he was to be and i basically lived my life based on what he wanted me to do so to the point where the only thing I had control over was maybe my job in school because he couldn't stop me from going to school or going to work. But when it came to doing other things, I had to be on his clockwork. I had to be on his schedule. I had to do what he wanted me to do. I had to go where he wanted me to go. I had to stay home if he wanted me to stay home. So yeah, I gave him permission to be the superintendent of my life. Hmm. So sis, I mean, that's, that's definitely very powerful. And I think um, you know, sometimes when you're on the outside looking in, when you hear some of these stories, it's almost like, how in the world does a person, you know, allow someone that much power over them? But it's not until you're like in that position where you see how easily someone can be, you know, put in a position like that, especially um, when they're already kind of vulnerable, like, you know, in your case, having like immigration status and different things of that nature. So when people kind of take advantage of um, people who they deem to be weak or vulnerable or whatever, like, there's so many things that can come out of it, um, you know, so many negative things. And, you know, I'm so happy, obviously, that you were able to survive and come out on top. And, you know, you have this story that you can share with so many other people. And there was one part that was like really like moving to me where you at one point you just kind of I guess you were lost in your own thoughts and you were kind of standing in the kitchen, you know, holding, you know, holding a knife. And your brother thankfully kind of came at the right time and, you know, stopped you from whatever might have happened. Like, what would you say kind of like what? What do you remember in that moment, if you remember like anything, like what was going on in your mind that kind of led you to that point? Um, I think I was I was having an episode of regret. You know, um, I was I was looking at my life in this, um, you know, an episode of my life, and I kept telling myself, "Oh, oh man, you failed yourself. You failed yourself. You failed your family. You know, you came to this country. You know." went to school, struggled through school, made it, graduated, and then you got caught up with this man and it's been nothing but hell and hell and hell and hell. And here you are, you have nothing left. You can't work because you don't have um, proper documentation to work. He won't um, file in paperwork for you because he wants you to bow down to him. And you know, he's your, at this point, he's your master. And um, you've trailed along in a relationship that that, that, that is not worth it and you know a relationship that has been built on lies and here he is today you know dating at, at this point I didn't even know he was you know married to the other girl um, and he's messing around on you on the same girl that he's been messing around on you for years 
So I felt worthless and I was depressed and I felt like I didn't want to be here anymore. I felt like there was there was nothing I could give, you know. And sometimes I used to think that, you know, you can you can pick yourself back up and some days and I'm I'm like, no, there's no way I can pick myself back up. Like where am I gonna start? You know, and I felt like a failure. Um and that's you know, added to my depression, I felt like I didn't want to be here anymore and I, I wanted to save my life. You know, but God had other plans and he sent my brother right on time when he got into the kitchen and stopped that because he had other plans for me. Thank you, sis. Um, so I'm just going to ask one more question as it relates to this and I'm going to go on, like, on a happier note. Um, okay. <laughs> so, like, to be honest, reading your story, like, a lot of things were pretty triggering to me. Like, I was personally kind of getting upset at different moments because... You know, I hate reading about injustice or hearing about injustice. I hate, you know, people being mistreated, especially at the hands of someone who's supposed to, you know, love them and care for them. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was definitely hard to read it in the in the beginning, like when you were telling your story, like how you got from point A to point B and then, you know, everything that led up to the arrest and everything else. But I think one of the things that possibly bothered me the most is the fact that I think so many women or and even men because it's not just you know exclusive to women who are going through or who are living through like abusive relationships um sometimes like maybe when they report their abusers sometimes not a lot is done or maybe their abuser somehow gets away with it but then when things turn around let's say the one who's being abused like in your case finally kind of snaps as you you know the word that you used earlier and you know attacks or you know does something in retaliation to the other person somehow they end up getting in trouble and spending like you know years in, in prison or, or or whatever the case may be having to serve like extensive um sentences when they were the ones who have been abused for all these years so i mean i don't know if you can like truly speak to the fact of um you know what can people do if they are in these situations like how can they maybe document it so they can kind of protect themselves so that you know in the future you know they won't have to worry about maybe spending time behind bars when they were the ones who were dealing with the you know the abuse and the oppression and then the, the other question along with that is like did anything happen to him as far as like any type of jail time or any type of uh you know fines or any other punishment like like if you were to see him today how have you been able to kind of get over those feelings have you fully forgiven him like i think your mom was saying in, in the book like have you fully kind of gotten over like, are you at peace with everything that's happened? I guess is what I'm trying to ask. Um, okay, I'm gonna start with the first question. Um, if there's anybody out there who's being abused, man or woman, because it can happen to anybody, abuse is not, a lot of people think that only women are abused. There are men out there who are being abused too. Um, if you're in an abusive relationship, you need to get away from them and call the police and especially immigrants if you're i'm just putting this out there <laughs> if you're married to somebody and they're holding you know trying to file paperwork for you um through uscis for your legal status and they're using that as you know as a bait and they're putting their hands on you you need to call the cops i know a lot of people are scared if i call the cops like in my situation if i call the police you know i might get deported when they find out that i have no legal status but there are so many ways that um the immigration system can help you with that so if anybody's putting their hands on you, the only way that it can be documented is if you if you um, inform the authorities, if you call them. Um, and I wish I, I would have done that. Um, I remember my criminal defense attorney mentioned it a lot of times that I wish, I wish, I wish you should have called, you know, the police and I wish this was documented, you know, um, things would have been a little bit different. Um, as regards my sentencing and um, my prison time but um, please notify somebody if you're being abused and if it's emotional and mental 
leave them alone and get away from them as go as far as far away from them as you can because it's not worth it you know it's either going to end two ways one person is going to lose their life or you might end up in the same situation that i ended up in so think about it and 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 ask yourself if, if it's worth it um to address the next question i haven't seen my um my ex-husband i don't know where he's at i don't know anything about his whereabouts but um i did forgive him and i take some kind of responsibility for what he did to me because it was my responsibility to leave the relationship you know but i made the choice to stay um and now i don't know what i'm what i'm gonna say or do if i ever come across him or if, if i ever met him but <laughs> i don't wish him bad um i just hope that he you know he's not out there doing what he did to me to some other person because nobody deserves to go through what he put me through and um i have forgiven him it was it, it was hard it was very very hard it's it's not easy and sometimes I even try to catch myself and, and, and tell myself, do you really think that you've forgiven him? But um, I realized that I've forgiven him because sometimes, like in the past when I was incarcerated, I used to pray for him. Um, and to me, that that was a that was something that you know showed me that I've I've actually forgiven him. I've let go so I can have my peace and so I can move on with my life. And um, forgiving him has helped me to um move on you know emotionally and and i had to tell myself that if you don't forgive him somebody good is gonna come your way and you will you will always think that they are him because for a while i i didn't want to be in a relationship or anything i didn't want to deal with stuff like that because i was you know you know the, i had ptsd i was traumatized you know but um, I have forgiven him and, and, I've, and, and I've let go. But I do urge anybody out there, if you're in an abusive relationship, if you don't know what an abusive relationship looks like, call somebody and talk to them. Go online and research. <laughs> Just to make sure that you're either in the right place or you're not in the right place. So, yeah. Hmm. And um, actually, I forgot to like include this in my notes, but now that I remember it, um, you mentioned the fact that, because I think um, some people in their minds they may think, okay, well, it only it's, it's only a person who doesn't have like a strong sen uh, sense of self worth um, that gets into these kind of situations. But from what you know from your book, you said and you know that your dad kind of instilled in, into you and to your sisters, you know how strong you were, how beautiful you were, how intelligent you were, and you know how great you were as young women. So it's clear that you had that kind of upbringing. Um, you know, you had a good sense of self and everything else like that. So how, like, how does one make the connection of having this strong sense of self and then still getting in, involved in things that maybe they probably wouldn't have expected themselves to be in? So I think when you love somebody, when you love somebody, you tend, you tend to believe everything that they say. Um, you tend to believe everything that they say about you. And I think that was it for me. Um, and like you say, when you, you write in my book, um, I always grew up with a with a really, really high self-esteem because my dad always made sure to tell my sisters and I that we were smart, we were beautiful, and we had so much potential and we're intelligent. And he still does that till today. Um, if you read in my book, he, my dad always tells us that he loves us um, and, and he makes us understand our worth. But even if you've had that kind of um, upbringing and you've had that kind of security from your from your parents, you know, and you meet somebody and you fall in love with them, most of the times when you love somebody, whatever that person says to you, you turn to believe it. And with time, you just you just think that whatever that person says you are, that is who you are, you know, positive or negative. When you have a, a, a significant order in your life that appreciates you and tells you how good you look every day how beautiful you are and, and gives you all this positive attributes you believe it and you walk in self-confidence and you're like oh my god 
if my man or my woman thinks this about me, then I'm all that and a bag of chips. But when they start telling you that you're stupid, you, you're dumb, um, you're this, you're that, like if they start talking negative to you, then gradually and slowly you you lose all your self-worth and all your self-esteem. And even it 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 works even with parents. You know how they say that you have to speak positive to your kids? Because what you tell your kids that they are, they start to believe that that's what they are. Um, so it's the same thing. And because your kids love you, because they love mommy and daddy, or whatever mommy and daddy says I am, that's what I am. And because like it's the same thing, I love my dad, I love my parents. So everything that they said that I was or I could become when I was a little girl and growing up, I believed it. And I had that great self-esteem. And then I met somebody who just crashed my self-esteem, you know, little by little, little by little, until I, at some point I felt like I had none left. But I want to encourage anybody out there too, it's never too late to build your self-esteem back up. You may feel like you don't have it, but you have it. And it's not left to people to build it back up. It's left to you to build it back up. So um, it's never too late. You can lose your self-esteem and regain it <laughs> if you want to. Hmm. Thank you, sis. That, that was very beautiful. And I, I really love that analogy that you gave as far as like parents speaking positively to the children and then them believing, you know, those great things that the parents are saying towards them. And also how it works on the reverse if you know parents are speaking negatively that child is going to believe those negative things so it's, it's really important to build you know our children build ourselves and build those around us up um so that they can be the best person that they can possibly be for themselves and for others so just to kind of like you know get on a more positive note um even though you know of course life in prison is probably not like a very positive thing but um maybe you probably might argue that it was probably a good thing for you like would you kind of say that despite everything that went on obviously it was it probably was you know as we say everything happens for a reason but would you say that you kind of being going to jail kind of changed your life in many ways maybe maybe for good i will say that it did change my life um it saved my life because mm -hmm. i could have probably been dead <laughs> you know stress and you know like i said i was depressed could have killed me um and um it gave me time to it gave me time to regroup it wasn't i wasn't happy being there because i was away from my family <laughs> i i didn't have my freedom but like you said everything happens for a reason and i believe that god allowed because he could have as might as well stopped it from happening but he allowed for me to experience that because um he had so many lessons that he wanted to teach me because believe it or not every single day Behind bars, I had a lesson. Mm -hmm. There was a learning every single day, and I came out looking at life differently, much more differently than um, I did prior to that. When I went into prison, I was when I got locked up, I was 25, and when I got home, I was 31. So um, I feel like I basically grew up there, mm -hmm. and uh, and even though I was separated from um, from the society and people out here, I. It gave me time to to reflect on my life and and the decisions that I made, um, the mistakes that I made, and, and and to think about what was next. You know, what next? How can you fix this? You know, and um, believe it or not, I did a lot of a lot of soul searching and a lot of fixing me while I was in there. Hmm. That's that's the so you, I mean, you just said you celebrated six birthdays in prison, and. Yes. Um, <laughs> And you had like a birthday party each time. So I think that was really sweet for that your um, fellow inmates um, hosted parties for you. So despite the hardship and challenges that you faced, you know, during that time, as you just mentioned, um, I love that one thing that I really like appreciated while reading your story. Um, I love the fact that um, you were able to find joy in the little things and you made the most out of your situation. And you talked about some of the close friends and people that you met along the way, you know, that kind of helped your journey to be a little bit easier, like Eve, um, Miss Johnson, Ella, Rosa, and some others. Um, and you also found cleaning the bathrooms, not just as a job, but as a service that you could do for other people to, you know, help bring a smile to their face and just kind of make things easier for them. And then you also took up a small business certification course 
a catering class and obviously you even wrote this book during that time so what are some of those lessons that you know you just discussed um that you hope that readers of your book and those that are tuning into this chat um, will learn from your experiences you know coming to the u.s as an international student studying for and becoming a registered nurse and then unfortunately you know as things change getting involved with a toxic person being locked up for six years and then coming out now to tell your story and especially for um you know young girls and even young boys and like your nieces and nephews or or younger cousins or anyone else what do you hope that you know your story will tell them um for one i i want people to learn from my story that your circumstances um my change you know um it's not guaranteed that you will live a all happy life um like they say life is not always a bed of roses um but i want to encourage people out there to always make the best of your situation and wherever you are and um one thing I kept telling myself when I was incarcerated, every morning when I wake up, some mornings I didn't want to wake up, some mornings I wake up and I'll look, look around my cell and I'm like, oh my God, I'm still here. Um, but then I told myself, I'll have to push myself and say, hey, you still have life. You know, you still have life, you can walk around, you have strength in your body, you can, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do. So I, I learned not to worry about my environment, my physical environment. And um, I tried to make the best of the situation, um, do the things that um, I, I could not have done while I was out here. I learned a lot of things um, while I was in there. I took every opportunity to um, educate myself. You know, most of the classes that were taught there were like um, like certification classes and if, when you write it in my book a lot of people will make fun of me like you have a bachelor's degree why are you taking all these certification classes you know but um they say knowledge is power so i took my classes and um some of them have helped me like the catering um the catering class that i took you know i has helped me a lot out here with my cake business and um I just want to encourage anyone out there, whatever happens to you, whatever life throws at you, you have to always keep your hope alive. As long as you have breath, as long as you, you have strength in your body, you're going to make it through. You're going to make it through. Don't worry about what people say, um, because people will always talk. <laughs> um, think about you and think about how you're gonna you know turn your mistakes around you know dust yourself up you you're always when you fall you dust yourself up and get back up and, and keep going because nobody's gonna do it for you you can have family and friends that are gonna support you but at the end of the day it is your sole responsibility to to, to get back up when you fall so just make the best of every situation um, or circumstance uh, you know that life throws at you that's that's what i did and um keeping a positive mindset helped me a lot surrounding myself with positive people talking to positive people helped me a lot um staying away from from negativity and people who who don't have anything good to say but negative 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 um i don't know about y you but <laughs> negative energy drains me so um I just want people to be encouraged that if I could make it through, you can make it through. I love that. So finally, I want to ask, um, do you look at love and relationships differently? And um, what do you think it will take for you to feel ready for a true love at this uh, stage in your um, life? I, I do look at it differently. And, and the only thing that I, I look at, I, the one thing that I look at differently is um, love should not hurt, you know, um, love should not make me hurt like physically and it shouldn't make my heart hurt, you know, um, and um, I, I still think that there, there are good people out there, there are good men out there. Um, in the beginning, I didn't. I didn't want. I, I did not want to have to deal with any man. I, I didn't even want to hear it <laughs> because I, I had been through a lot of trauma, 
but um um, I don't want people, especially young girls and, and people who are trying to, you know, who are out there dating and, you know, getting involved in relationships to look at my story and, and, and think that, you know, true love isn't out there because true love is out there. Um, but I personally think right now that the worst thing that a, a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend can do to you is, is put you through abuse regardless of whatever form it is because if somebody loves you they will not they they will not want to see you hurt you know so i do look at love a little bit different i'm a little bit more cautious let me say that now i i see those signs everywhere <laughs> and i'm very much careful um but that is not to say that they're not good people out there or um there's not a good man out there you know who will who will treat me the way that i deserve to be treated very powerful point so, so just just to kind of make uh, make a kind of funny comment um you know kind of growing up you know we always hear like our <laughs> african parents african aunties and uncles um they kind of view you know dating like oh you know focus on your studies focus on your books don't worry about that until you're like you know you've graduated college and you've done all this so like just kind of with that in mind a little bit like would you kind of say maybe the same thing to like your um maybe your nieces and your nephews like as they're growing up to kind of focus in one direction or the other or how would you i guess guide them as it relates to um you know relationships as they grow up um well my my sis my little sisters and you know you know one of my sisters is married and she's married to an amazing man i, I love my brother-in-law um my other sister is in a relationship with um, somebody that I, you know, I think is good for her. And, um, but I have a niece and a lot of people know that I'm fun of her. Um, that's my baby. And from my experiences, um, I, I pray for her every day and I hope that um, she finds, when she gets older, she finds a man that will love her the way that she deserves to be loved. But, um, when you talk about focusing on school and all of that stuff, I, I don't think that finishing school is a prerequisite for you to um, to date or to get married. You know, <laughs> I think if I think if the right person, the right person comes, you know, take that opportunity, you know, um, I think people should pay more attention to um, is it the right person for me? Am I being treated right? Am I being loved the right way? Um, am I being loved the way that um, God desires for this man to love me? Um, because if he's not loving you the way that God wants you to love, wants him to love you, or if she's not loving you the way God desires for her to love you, then it's not it's not the right situation for you to be in. So I I don't think you know African parents are all about you need to finish school before you get married and. And it's not a to me. It's not a prerequisite, and I won't I won't make it a prerequisite for my kids or or my niece because I have seen very successful marriages where um, either of them didn't even finish school before they got married, and they finished school while they were married and probably already had kids and all of that. So I don't think that finishing school or achieving success in your career should be a, 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 a prerequisite for a marriage <laughs> that's, that's a good point i think to be honest i think the most important thing is just um before you get into anything with anyone just know who you are and know who, what you stand for so that if someone is presenting something that is contrary to what you believe then you know this is not for me and you know just find i guess enough um maybe appreciation of your own self you know knowing what you what is you like what you don't like and like understanding who you are i think before you know anything like that so i think that's just that's definitely one thing um that everyone should do and um so since could you first of all thank you so much i once again i really appreciate the fact that you took this time to you know write your story for us to all read and learn from and that you were willing to come on and talk to us about your experiences i know it can be you know challenging to kind of talk about these things sometimes so you know as we round up what are some things you can say to the listeners and to the viewers um, you know, some final words of encouragement or, and also how they can reach you, how they can support your business, how they can, um, you know, buy your book or just anything that you would like to say as we close out. 
Um, I just have one message to leave to my listeners. Um, if I can bounce back, you can bounce back. It's never too late. Sometimes you're gonna have to um, turn the volume down on all the external noises out there because um, it is your responsibility to get yourself back, to dust yourself up and to stand up and keep pushing and keep moving. And it's never too late. Um, I used to panic when I was locked up. I used to think, I'm like, oh my God, when I get out, I'm gonna be 30. Oh my God, I probably won't ever get married again. Oh my God, I probably won't have kids because it's gonna be too late, but it's never too late. It's never, never too late. Don't let people deceive you into thinking that, you know, life is over because um, you took a wrong direction. Don't let the devil deceive you um, into thinking that there's no hope for you anymore and that's the end. So I just want to encourage everybody out there who's listening that, you know, it's not over until God says it's done. And um, to purchase my book, the title is Cars to Stars. It's available on Amazon. Um, to purchase a, an autographed copy, you can go to my website and Alogueres Cars to Stars dot com. Um, you can visit my Facebook page um, for any questions that you have um, in regards to the book. Um, my Facebook page name is Anne Alobuede, and you can visit me on Instagram. Same thing, Anne Alobuede. And it was it was nice, you know, talking a little bit about myself and my story and and sharing my experiences with you. Um, and it was a pleasure. Thank you so much, sis. I, once again, I appreciate you so much for being here. And um, I really hope that your story, um, you know, can help someone else who may be going through this or is seeing signs in their own um, in their own lives. So thank you again for opening up and allowing others into your world and into your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me um, have this opportunity to talk a little bit about my story and the message of my book. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sis. Thank you. Thank you.